youth, tear upon the core of blasphemy. Follow your prophet, and on evil make a victory. Let our righteousness be a role model to our children, making new generations of believers decently upbringing with parents as an example. As gems we shape them, fearing only Allah, devoting our lives for Him. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, peace. Welcome to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Welcome. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, uh, Today, I think it might be a good idea to discuss the gap between what is Sunnah and what is not Sunnah. Because there's some people, some people think that there are some things that the Prophet Muhammad used to do this, and maybe it's culture or, you know, something else. So, uh, you know, have you experienced anything like that dealing with Muslims? <laughs> Every day, hmm. Omar. This subject usually we we make the contrast between the two subjects: Sunnah versus Bid'ah. Hmm. The Sunnah versus Bid'ah. Sunnah means the way, and Bid'ah means the innovation. Right. <clears throat> now, when Islam came, it was a Bid'ah. Mm. <laughs> Islam was a Bid'ah right. to these people because they didn't have it. So it was new. It was a change for them. Right. To what is Islam? Islam is to believe in one God and then structure your life around what that God wants you to do. Right. That is is the essence of the word Islam. So when Islam came to these people, these barbaric people living in the desert who had the worst of culture, the worst kind of uh, character and without any morals, the horrible mistreatment of women and children and the way that the men were so patriarchal in their dealings, just uh, suffice to say, not good. All right? So here is Islam coming, talking about rights for women, rights for children, rights for people, rights in marriage, has to be marriage, no more fooling around, raping women, things that they mm -hmm. used to do. So Islam is coming now and changing everything, and that is to them a bid'ah, mm -hmm. a big bid'ah, a big innovation. A good innovation, but to them it was different, and people resist that, you see. Mm -hmm. Well, after Islam is established, then anything that changes that, what's established, sunnah, mm. what changes it, this is bid'ah. Mm. So the sunnah of those people before Islam was something despicable and nothing you and I would want. Right. The bid'ah, Islam comes huh, and corrects all that. Right. Now this becomes the way, the sunnah, huh, and anything that will take away from that or change that, this is the bid'ah. Oh, this is how it works. Right. Now, what did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, say about that? He said, Kulu bid'atun dalala wa kulu dalalatun finar. That every innovation is misguiding. And all the misguidings are into the fire of hell. So it was considered by him to be the most evil of all the amalit or actions is to engage in bid'ah. Right. So how would we today still be able to do and live according to the way that those people lived 1400 years ago? Mm. Certainly there have been many bid'ah along the way. Right. We could look immediately to some of the things around us. Zippers and buttons. Mm. Well, I think they had buttons, but they certainly they didn't have the style of clothing we have. They didn't have the facilities that we've got here. Certainly right. didn't have TV studios and cameras. Right. They didn't have microwave ovens. And how in the world are you going to make coffee without a microwave? <laughs> they didn't have Starbucks. Oh, boy. Right. <laughs> a lot of stuff, you know. Yeah. So how do we deal with that today? Yeah. Well, in Islam, we have a general rule. When it comes to the world you live in, called the Hayat dunya this world that we live in every day, Everything is okay. Mm. You can do these things. Even these bid'ah are all right. right. As long as they are not violating an, or something that's mandated, not in violation of a clear law in Islam. Mm. So if there is a prohibition against it, then you can't do it. Right. 
But if there is nothing clearly in Islam against it, then you can do it. Mm. Nothing in Islam said I can't use a microwave oven. Right. Nothing in Islam says I can't drive a car. Mm. My wife says I can't drive one, but that's another story. <laughs> in Islam, you are free to do whatever you want to do as long as you don't find an injunction against it. Right. In the life, mm. the daily life. But there's another side of the coin. Turn it over. The other side of the coin says that anything dealing with ibada or worship, any kind of worship, is forbidden unless you can find something in Islam that gives you clear permission to do it. Mm. So it's the opposite. In daily life, do it unless you find evidence that says, no, no. Right. Worship, don't do it unless you find a proof for it. Right. That makes it simple. Right. So could we say then that, would it be correct to say that uh, in, in life, uh, in your daily life, in your job, in your building houses, construction zone, Islam would encourage innovation, but in your religion, Islam would prohibit innovation. Absolutely forbidden to innovate in the religion. Right. Now, some people will, will mix it up and they'll say, well, everything in Islam is religion. Well, Islam encompasses all that you do. Right. In that sense, true. But we didn't mean religion. And that's mm. why I said the Arabic word, right. ibadah. Mm. Ibadah doesn't mean religion. Right. It means a form of worship right. to fulfill an obligation with your Lord. Mm. Now, God Almighty has insisted that we as Muslims pray five times a day. Right. Okay, so if somebody come along and say, well, five is good. I want to make it six. <laughs> well, he can pray six times a day, but he can't order other people to do this and he can't mandate it on himself. Right. Because that's not what it said. Mm. And we have uh, raqqah that we do in the salah. number of times we stand and bow and prostrate. Right. Well, the one in the morning is only two. Mm. But what if he said, you know, I just want to do one. I got up in the morning. I don't feel like doing one. I'll just do one. No, you can't do that. Right. You can't change it. Likewise, it's mandated in the Quran, chapter 2, verse 183, telling us, O you who believe, Ordered for you is psalm, fasting, as it was ordered for the people before you, mm. that you may attain God consciousness. All right? Now, what does that fasting mean? Well, it's from the time the sun rises to the time the sun goes down in the month of Ramadan. Well, now, somebody come along and say, well, that sounds fair enough. But you know what? It's so hot in the summer, and at Ramadan... The lunar calendar is coming in summer. Why don't I just wait till Christmas time? You know, it's nice and cool then. You know, I can chill and just take it easy. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. No, because this is not what it says in the Quran. Right. So that worship would not be accepted. Now, you can fast if you want to at Christmas time all you want to. <laughs> or Easter time or any time of the year. Go ahead, mm -hmm. fast. Who cares? But don't say that that was mandated because right. it wasn't. And you have changed something. So that kind of innovation would not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So tell me more about the Sunnah. What do we mean when we say Sunnah? What kind of things entail Sunnah? The word Sunnah itself, as we've mentioned before, encompasses how something is done. Mm -hmm. The world turning, that's the Sunnah of the world. Right. The universe moving, that's the Sunnah of the universe. Mm -hmm. How you do what you do, that's your Sunnah. So everything has a Sunnah to it. But in the sense of the linguistics, and sometimes we use the word and give a specific meaning, so much so that people that are not Arabs begin to think that's what the word means. Some of the Muslims believe the word Sunnah just means something about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And some believe that his sayings and teachings are the Sunnah. But in reality, you study a little bit more, you find something called Hadith, that means stories, these hadith are narrated on the authority of reliable people saying, I saw or heard the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, accept or reject or ignore such and such things. That's called a hadith. Right. The hadith is describing the sunnah. Mm. Some people will say the sunnah is whatever Muhammad did. That would not be wrong. Mm. They would say the hadith are sunnah. That would not be wrong, right. but it doesn't give you a total picture of understanding what is sunnah. What's important for us to understand, though, is what is the difference between sunnah and bid'ah. In the life, you want to remember, in the life you can do what you want. Unless you find evidence in Islam, don't do that. Right. 
For instance, that we have a bida, a refrigerator. Mm. Excellent thing is this refrigerator. I love my refrigerator. Now, we've been forbidden to eat hanzir, lahan hanzir, which means pork, the meat of the pork. We cannot eat it. Right. But now we have a refrigerator. Oh, guys, guess what? The reason we probably couldn't eat the meat of this pork back then was because it's so dangerous in the maggots and things that it gets in it, these right. little hookworms or what. Mm. So, but now with a refrigerator, you can slaughter this meat just like any other. You know, they call it the new white meat or something mm. now. And we can put it in the fridge, keep it over there. Now it's good to go. Mm. Okay, refrigerator is okay. It's a bit out, but it's okay. Mm. Putting the pork in there and eating it later is not okay. Right. Why? Because so many verses in Quran telling you, uh, for the believers, here's your dietary rule. You can have whatever you want. Everything is made good for you on this day, except the things which are clearly forbidden. Don't eat the meat of any animal that's been killed by a concussion. Right. Anything that fell and broke its neck. Mm -hmm. uh, roadkill. It doesn't say roadkill, but, you know, if it got hit by a Mack truck, uh, sorry, you don't eat that. Right. So, and anything which is blood, don't eat uh, or drink raw blood. Right. And I happen to know a member of my own family who used to go in the slaughterhouse slaughtering pigs. And one of the things they would do, he liked to slaughter them on a winter day, you know. Because when they would slaughter them, this blood would come pouring out, steam coming from that hot blood, catch it in a cup and he would drink the pork blood. Mm. And the pudding in... UK is not the pudding you and I know <laughs> from Jello pudding. Right. The pudding they have is actually blood pudding. Yeah. Those things are forbidden to us. Mm. And there's nothing you're going to do, a refrigerator, microwave, nothing you're going to do to make it permitted or halal for us. Right. Well, Sheikh, we're going to go to a quick break. We'll be right back, so don't go anywhere. You're watching Closing the Gap. Fearing only Allah Devoting our lives for Him. Be proactive. Dr. Haitham Al Haddad teaches us how to take a conscious control over our life, set our goals, and work to achieve them in Islam. Take firm steps towards your future, be positive, and be proactive. Every single Muslim needs to have in order to be an effective person. So proactivity uh, in Islam, how to serve our religion and how to serve uh, our life and our guides through all of this. The proactive person is always motivated. The proactive person always have high ambition. The proactive person, he will not lose his time. He will not waste his time. The proactive person is a generous person. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, today we're closing the gap between the Sunnah and Bidah. Okay. okay. And uh, I want to start moving it now into the direction of uh, what does Islam have to say about these things. Um, but before we get there, could you explain to us what do we mean by Bidah? Well, as we said, the Bidah is anything new. Mm. Anything that didn't exist before, suddenly it's there. Right. So as we mentioned, Islam was a bid'ah to the people of Jahiliyyah, the ignorant people who were idol worshippers. They were people who didn't believe just in one God, but they had many gods. Although they said Allah, but still they had other ways to get to Allah. So right. this, these people saw Islam as being a bid'ah. But once Islam is established, it became established or sunnah. And then anything that comes in changes that would be a bid'ah. Mm. Are there any kinds of uh, common bid'ahs, uh, bid'ah in terms of the religion that we're that we're seeing today? One of the things the Prophet, peace be upon him, said is that whoever introduces a bid'ah into the religion of Islam, 
never will it be accepted from him. Mm. And this was narrated on authority of his wife. She said that he said, whoever introduces something new to this religion, it will never be accepted. About that subject, Allah said in the Quran, in chapter 5, verse 3, that he perfected our religion. Clearly, it, he says it, al yawmul akmatu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum nifati wa raditulukum islam ad That Allah is saying, I perfected for you your way of life. Your, your Islam is perfected for you. This is your religion, perfected. It's a big favor for you. My right. biggest of favors for you. Right. And I chose for you to submit and surrender in peace to me. Mm. That's the, more or less the meaning of this. Now, if we go back a couple of chapters to Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 85. Allah says here, وَمَمْ يَغْخَغِ غَيْرُ الْإِسْلَامَدِينَ فَلَا يُقْبَلَا مِنْ هُوَ هُوَ فِي الْأَخِرْتِ مِنُ الْخَاسَرِينَ And the more or less the meaning to English is, whoever is seeking after any other way to get to Allah as a religion, a way of life, then Allah is not going to accept it from them. Mm. Because they're making up their own religion. And in the hereafter, they will be with the losers. Mm. So we see clearly from the Quran and from the teachings of Muhammad, without doubt, it is not permissible to introduce something in Islam that's not from Islam. Mm. So, in this case then, uh, could we say that, uh, you know, you see people worshipping or worshipping in the graveyards, for example. And this is not uncommon in some areas in the Muslim world. So, to my knowledge, that has no precedent in, in Sunnah or anything. Is that correct? Or <clears throat> I was told this same thing when I came into Islam. But on closer investigation, especially in one of the countries that I visited, I found that the people were not really worshipping anybody in a grave. Mm. In fact, it, it was Turkey. And they were telling me, oh, these big graveyards, and they go there to worship. What happened after the time of Kamal Pasha, Ataturk, mm. the one who destroyed Islam mm. for all of us, really. When he came in, there was no possible way anybody could go to a mosque and worship anymore because mm. the mosques were turned into horse stables. Oh. The scholars were hung by the neck until they were dead mm. right in front of the people. So if you wanted to practice Islam, where would you go? You mm. had to do it in your home and you had to be really quiet about it. Mm. How, where would you meet anybody? So I found that one of the things they used to do is go to the graveyards. Oh. Because everybody goes to the graveyard and buries somebody, you know. Right. And so other people could come and there was no suspicion attached to it. But when they were at the graveyard, they used to talk and visit and share information. And sometimes they would even pray there, even though we're not supposed to be praying in graveyards. Mm. But they made special areas even for children to play and hang out there, have picnics. And when I visited, I said, man, it looks kind of like Disneyland with graves mm. in it. And they said this is the why behind it. Mm. And I found also a sign, a clear sign to me about it was, they were talking about all oh, these Turks have always been this way. But what I noticed, it, it tipped me off right away. These huge headstones. And they were complaining. The Muslims were complaining. Look at these huge headstones. They're somewhere six, seven feet tall. Taller than me. Mm. With the name of the person in Turkish language and everything on it. But there were no dates prior to 1922. SubhanAllah. All of them were since that time, or mm. 23, whatever it was, since the time of Islam being oppressed. Mm. There were no giant markers prior to those dates. So it was very clear what was happening. And maybe they used the markers for something too. That I don't know. Mm. But it became very clear that that was the case there. Now, in other cases, I have seen places where they have a tomb inside of a mosque. Mm. And they say, this is a saintly person. And, you know, we want to get his blessings while we're praying and things like that. And I don't want to pray in those places. Mm. Now, in the Masjid Medina, that's mm. in Mecca, yeah. I mean, in uh, mm. Saudi Arabia, right. Mecca, Medina. The Prophet Muhammad's grave is inside the mosque. We think, but not according to their law, it's not. Because his wall of his house was, on, his, on one side his house, the other side of the wall was the mosque, even in his lifetime. And when he died, he has to be buried where he dies, so they buried him there. Also buried there is his good companion and friend, Abu Bakr, next to him, and on the other side is Omar. Another good friend, companion, Muslim. 
leader. Now, since then, the mosque has had to expand to allow for the many hundreds of thousands of worshippers coming there all the time. So they have expanded in the front and the back, the side. But not on that one side. They don't allow any worshiping to go over there. So they consider this to be not enclosed. So right. it's not totally enclosed, but there is a line going on that side, a line on this side, and of course the one that was already there to start with. Mm. So I want to make that clarification to some who might go there and they'll make Hajj or something and say, Oh my God, there's mm. a grave in a masjid and the biggest of all, and what is going on with that? Right. But some who want to worship at grave sites use that as a proof in their favor mm. when it's not in their favor whatsoever. Now, I'm remembering a, a, a verse of the Quran that... that when I first read it, it seemed kind of a minimal complaint. I thought, what is this? Where Allah, God, is condemning the pagans of Mecca, the, the polytheistic people of Mecca, because they were worshipping idols at that time, saying that they slit the ears of cattle. And it said that there's no, they have no authority to do that. And I, at the time, I thought, well, that's kind of a very small thing. It's kind of strange. But then I realized... It's like setting a precedent, you know. Don't even if you think it's small, you, if you don't have authority for it, don't do it. Is is that something that we could derive from that? Verse? Uh, yes. And by the way, why were they slit, making the slit in the ears? There was superstition attached to that. Mm. It's not just a matter of branding a cow. You can brand a cow. Right. But whenever you start tattooing these cows with markings and things, believing that this is going to be a benefit. Right. or help you to get more cattle from them, or protect you from something. All of these superstitions that people had, mm. that is the problem. Mm. Today we have people poking holes in their ears, and their nose, and their tongues, and their stomachs, and who knows where else, and I, don't tell me. <laughs> uh, what we're saying is that this is wrong in Islam for a different reason. Mm. It has nothing to do with the slitting of that ear, but that was superstition. But it's wrong because you're damaging your body. Right. And you we're not supposed to be damaging our bodies. Right. SubhanAllah. Well, I think uh, I think we've dealt dealt with the subject uh, with a, with a lot of justice today. But maybe just in in kind of uh, summarizing, what can we say that Islam clearly says about the Sunnah? Is it absolutely mandatory that we we follow the Sunnah, and absolutely mandatory that we add no bid'ah to the religion whatsoever? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, told us. And clear, clear. He said, there is nothing about Islam that you have to do except that I've commanded you to do it. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing about Islam that you should stay away from except that I have clearly forbidden you from it. Mm -hmm. So everything that is permitted is clear and everything that's forbidden is clear. And if there's any doubt in between, he said, leave the doubt for what does not make you doubt. Mm -hmm. If you have a doubt about something, get away from it. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is, don't do it. Refer it to scholars and find out the answer to it. Mm. SubhanAllah. Well, uh, Sheikh, I think we have a couple of minutes left. If you would like to just give our audience uh, some advice real quick before we uh, close the show. Yeah. One of the things when I came into Islam, I heard a lot of things from a lot of people. Uh, Muslims would tell me, do this, and others would say, don't do that. Mm. The subject about how long can your dress be. Mm. The subject of how long your beard has to be. Or how long the tooth stick has to be. I started feeling like somebody could pull out a tape measure and just see how much Islam I really had going for me. You right. know, well, let's see, he's got about three inches extra of Islam here, but not enough over there. Maybe we can round him out. No, I think we're going to write him up and give him a ticket today. Well, the most important thing on this is let's don't be hard on each other. Mm. Let's give everybody a break. When I came into Islam, I didn't know anything. I had to start from scratch. And there are a lot of people who would like to know about Islam, but they're just not ready to do everything. There are ladies who would like to know a lot about Islam, but they're just not ready to put a head covering on and go walking down the street like that. Right. But they would like to hang out, see what's going on with the Muslims. I'd like to read some more. Can I do this and that? And you got people telling them, no, you can't. Look at, look at the Quran. You know, you've, uh, you're a disbeliever. Hmm. Or what was the thing you said? <laughs> you, did you eat pork today? <laughs> did you, yeah, somebody tell you that if they ate pork, they couldn't touch the Quran. There are too many things out there that really are not Islam. Right. And then there are some things out there that really are Islam that the Muslims aren't following. Right. So what we do is we try to encourage everybody, reliable sources, somebody you know, you trust them, you know that they understand where they're pulling from the Quran and the teaching 
or Sunnah mm. of Muhammad. Mm. Do that. And then, inshallah, if your prayers are sincere to Allah and asking Him to guide you, you'll be guided. You'll be fine. Okay. Well, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. That's all the time that we have for this particular episode. We hope to see you next time. Uh, until then, I'm your host, Omar Dunlap, wishing you peace. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, youth, tear upon the core of blasphemy. Follow your prophet and on evil make a victory. Let our righteousness be a role model to our children, making new generations of believers decently upbringing with parents as an example. As gems we shape them, fearing only Allah, devoting our lives for Him.